Hello, I'm Rob. And I'm Rob. And this is Ask Rob and Rob. Hello everyone and welcome back to Ask Rob and Rob, where you send us questions and we answer them every single Tuesday. And this Tuesday is no different because you keep sending your lovely questions in. And that's probably because, one, we answer them, and two, we make it very easy for you to do so. So if you'd like to get your question in, a quick reminder on how to do that, Rob. Yep, just call 013-808-0035. So that's 013-808-0035. Leave us a voicemail there or leave us a voicemail via thepropertyhub.net slash ask. Dead easy, so easy. Two people have done that this week. The first of whom is Tom from Manchester. So let's hear what Tom's question is. Hi, Rob and Rob. This is Tom from Manchester. Um, Firstly, thank you for providing some really useful resources on Property Podcast and your website. It's really useful for beginner investors such as myself to sift through everything that's involved in uh, property investing. It's a real big help. So thank you for that. Uh, I've got a question regarding um, leaseholds on flat. So me and my partner are looking to buy a flat uh, in Stockport. Uh, It's good price and we're quite happy with the flat. Uh, looking to make an offer but we've found out that the lease term remaining is 89 years Um, I'm aware that when you get to around the 80 year mark um, things like marriage value kick in and extending the lease term uh, can become a lot more expensive because we're going to be holding it for the medium to long term this is basically going to be a factor with this flat if we do proceed with it so I'm really just wondering what your thoughts are on lease terms and whether you've got any minimum lease terms that you would consider or at what point you'd start negotiating on price and if so um, what kind of effect you'd have on your offer if uh, if it was nearing the 80 year mark I'd say not really sure how best to proceed with this given that we're going to be getting around the 80 year mark uh, really interested on in your thoughts on this thanks thanks Tom great question also like the area you're investing in one I'm a big fan of so it's great to hear from you but let's answer your question But before we do, let me give you my general rule of thumb. We'll go into the specifics of your answer in a minute, but I'll tell you what I do, and this is how I approach it. So what I do is I I look for properties with 125 years or more. And the simple reason is, is that a lot of properties these days will come with 100 years. Some will come with more as well, but new builds are sold with 100, sometimes more. But I always look for 125. And the rationale behind that is, If I hold it for a whole mortgage term, so 25 years, I've gone down to 100 years, which is still more than acceptable in nearly everybody else's eyes. So it doesn't affect my saleability. However, if I went lower and started at 100 years, after 25 years, I'd be down at 75. So starting to get into the realms where you're looking at right now, which can cause some challenges. However, it doesn't mean you can't buy it and it doesn't mean it's not a good investment in fact it can also be an opportunity but Rob why don't you expand yeah I will and I'm actually going to be going through a lease extension this year and so because we get a lot of questions like that I'll make sure that I keep all the notes and so I can describe it all and maybe we can do a podcast about it at some point but the gist of it is as you quite rightly say Tom 80 years is when things start getting expensive that's when you get this thing called marriage value which basically means that extending the lease when it's under 80 years even if it's just by a day is going to be a lot more expensive than when it's over 80 years by a day so if you're looking at something that's about 89 years and you're looking to hold it for the long term then that means that yes you will have to go through a lease extension at some point because you'll want to get that through before it ticks down to 80 years so because it can take a little while I would say start when you're sort of around the 82, 83 mark to make sure that you get it done in time. In the meantime, how much is the value affected? Not enormously. It's the 80 year mark that really makes a difference. If you've got two identical properties, one of them has an 89 year lease and the other has a 125 year lease, the one that has 125 years is going to have a higher value, but it's not by an enormous amount. So I wouldn't personally let the fact that there's 89 years left put me off as long as I was prepared to go through the process of extending it. What you can also do is go to the website of the Leasehold Advisory Service and they've got a calculator on there that will give you an idea of how much that lease extension will cost. So if you're comfortable going through the rigmarole of doing it, 
and you're comfortable with the cost when you have to extend it, it's only an estimate, but it will give you an idea. Then you can just factor that into your figures. If it still seems like a good investment, then go for it. So Rob's personal rule makes a lot of sense. For flats like this, you just have to try and work out as best you can what the effect will be and take it into account. And as Rob alluded to as well, if you do get down to really short leases, so you're going below 80 and perhaps you're finding properties available have only got 60 years left or something like that, there can be an opportunity in that type of property because they often won't be mortgageable. The vendor will know that they've got a problem. Um, They probably can't afford to extend the lease. Therefore, you can go in there, buy it with cash, extend the lease and restore its full value. So it can be a challenge. It can be an opportunity. Like so many things in life, it depends how you look at it. So thank you, Tom. And next up, we've got Rhys. Hello, Rob and Rob. My name is Rhys. I am after some advice on some schemes that I've seen. I've got a bit of money to invest, and I'm looking to try out a couple of different options, uh, a HMO, uh, a normal residential property. And I've also seen some uh, schemes regarding investing in student properties or hotel rooms, which offer a guaranteed yield. I was wondering how that works. Uh, it sounds a little bit too good to be true. Uh, is it too good to be true? And if you would consider any of these types of schemes where you pay the money and then completely have projects, what would uh, make something seem like a good deal to you and what would you avoid at all costs? Thank you very much for the podcast. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. Goodbye. Oh, Rob, this sounds like they're just inviting you to to have a rant. Would Would you like to get into this? A rant? Oh, I have. I am known for an occasional rant. I'll. I'll see. I'll. I'll try and be. I'll try and be polite. This is nothing against you, Reese. So I'll. I'll start with that. It's a great question because these types of properties investments are heavily marketed, but they're heavily marketed for a reason. And the, one of the main reasons is, is they are loaded with commission for the sellers. And if they're loaded with commission, someone's paying for that, and that's you. And also the guaranteed rent that you're talking about is also being paid for by you. They're not doing this out of the goodness of their hearts. So if they're loading all this into the margin, then you have to ask yourself, where's the value? I also question, you know, these student pods. And if you Google student pods, you'll see an article from The Telegraph where I um, don't talk very kindly about them. Um, and these hotel rooms, they're not great investments. Who Who's going to buy them from you? Where's the resale market as well? I really, really feel passionate about this. And, I, and actually, uh, occasionally, although I've, I've calmed down now over the years, angry about these type of investments because I think they are s- so poor. It's clever marketing. And really, they're not aimed at UK investors. Yes, they are sold to UK investors. But actually... A lot of the overseas investors, the overseas markets, particularly in the Far East, are hammered with these type of investments all the time. And that's because they want hands off. The marketing's slick and the promises are big, but unfortunately, in many cases, the results are poor. And I've seen multiple cases of rental guarantees being winded up and not given out after a few years, which means that actually you've paid for it and then you don't even get it as well. So a, a double loss. So not one I think you should consider. I know a lot of people who've been burnt by them. I know a lot of people who've made a lot of money selling them. Not Something I've never sold, never will want to sell. I don't believe in it, wouldn't buy one myself. So how could I offer it to other people? So there you go, Rob. I was reasonably calm there, but hopefully I got the point across. I think that was pretty restrained. He did well. And I, of course, completely agree. For me, it's just like if someone is trying really, really hard to sell you something, why? If it's that good an opportunity, why are they trying so hard? And if it's that good, then why are they trying to have to throw in things like rental guarantees? It just it just doesn't make any sense to me. It's red flags all round. So it's always dangerous to say never, but if whenever something like that comes into my inbox, which it seems to do all the time, even though I never signed up for it, that's always a straight delete or marker spam for me. So hopefully you find that useful, Reese, and we got to you in time. Good luck with your investment journey. Another red flag marker for me, though, Rob, is when I meet a property investor who doesn't read and subscribe to the Property Hub magazine. Absolutely. I mean, how can you have expect to have any success or happiness or joy in your life without subscribing to the Property Hub magazine? Am I taking it too far? <laughs> no, no, not at all like the uh, previous investments. <laughs> and you get guaranteed return on knowledge, but only if you read it and you don't know what you've read. Now, we're not going to make silly big claims, but what we will claim is that it is extremely popular. 
last year subscribers doubled so i think that speaks volumes for the the quality of the magazine rob and i are really really passionate about it we feel like it's an incredible tool and it doesn't cost a lot so take advantage of it go to the property hub dot net forward slash magazine that's the property hub dot net forward slash magazine get signed up it's only five pounds a copy and that includes delivery i can assure you if nothing else it's a beautiful product it is so head off and do that right now and then we'll see you again on thursday for another episode of the property podcast bye-bye for now